Bananas are... Bananas! Well, learn a lot. If you want to learn some more, I know you already know things, but if you want to learn more about coral reefs, or about natural habitats, or about the Jason Project, there's a special place we can go to in Bermuda. You know that place, don't you? What yes. is it? The Biological Station. Okay, let's put some information into the... Superstar Super Screen. All right. All right, Biological Station, here we come. Hello learn a lot. I'm Tony Knapp, director of the Bermuda Biological Station, or the Biostation as you all know it. It's been here since 1903 and the purpose of it is to study the ocean and the atmosphere around Bermuda from the perspective of Bermuda. I'd like to welcome you here and hope you enjoy your visit. some physical parameters in the water down to about four and a half um, thousand meters or four and a half kilometers under the ocean. Down here is a whole load of um, electronic gadgetry that measures all of the physical parameters. There's, we've got things that shine light, this one shines light as well and sees how much of the light doesn't get through to a detector on the other side and you can tell how much uh, sediment's in the water. We've got um, a probe that will measure the depth uh, there's one that measures how much oxygen is in the water, there's uh, ones that measure the conductivity of the water, it passes a small electrical current through it, and there's one that also measures the temperature as well. What does CTD stand for? It stands for conductivity, temperature and depth, which basically are the three main parameters that the electronics measures. Um, so that's what it's been uh, traditionally set up as. But also with this one we've got the rosette sampler on it, so that um, that measures the, or collects the water. Why are you examining the water? We look at the water for a lot of different reasons, but uh, they're all to do with how the ocean is uh, producing um, food for little uh, for the fishes, and uh, it's also all to do with uh, the global stuff, with how, how the water's moving globally. So, the water we collect from the oceans, we fill up various bottles, this is an example of which, that well, we can put into a rack up here and filter easily through a filter here and these just plug into these and there's a vacuum pump over here that sucks up all, all the water through so we can collect all the little microorganisms that are on the, that are too small to actually pick out by hand, we can collect them on the filters. What's in the fridge? Well actually it's a freezer and these samples are of nutrients are, are for nutrient analysis so that we can tell how much of the little nutrients that the plants need to grow, the little phytoplankton need to grow. Uh, so that's what we use this for. This is for storage so that we can then come back to the lab and analyze it later. What is that thing down there? What exactly? Can we go down and have a look? This is a fume hood. So if we're working with some dangerous chemicals we can but it wouldn't be good to inhale. We can work in here, and there's a vent at the top here that sucks it all out. It's just like the hood over your stove at home. Okay, so this is the main lab where we collect and analyze our samples. Um, the ship goes out for about a maximum of five days, so we can uh, accommodate up to about 18 people on this boat, I think, including the scientists and, and the crew. We've got quite a few crew, so that's rather important. Um, so, should we go and have a look at 
what they do and where we live. Okay guys, come on in. Right, so this is where we sleep. We've got four people that can actually sleep in this. This is the scientists who go out. Each of them has a curtain that will close, so we work on various shifts. So not everybody in this, not everybody goes to sleep at say nine o'clock every night. Everybody, there'll be some people going to bed at different times. So you want to be able to close the curtain so that you can actually sleep while the other people are getting up and changing and going out. Do you dress for dinner? Well, yes, we do, but we try and wear some clean clothes, not nothing covered with oil and all the rubbish that we've been working in all day. How do you stay in bed when the water's rough? Well, that at times is hard, and one of the easiest ways to stay in bed is not to sleep, really. You tend to just lie there and wish you could get to sleep. But uh, other people have various things, from sticking their legs underneath the mattress to putting other pillows up and all sorts of things like that. Basically, you don't sleep all that much. How about some privacy here? Okay guys, let's go into the galley. So as you can see, the galley is just like any normal kitchen. We've got a fridge and a freezer. We've got a big fridge and freezer out the back. We've got a range, sink, washing machine, everything. Has anybody ever burned anything? Well, I think a few things have been burnt, but uh, often some hands get burnt because in here when you're working with the oven and the ship's rolling, it's a bit hard to keep your hands in the same place the whole time. Do you bring your own food or do people bring it for you? We actually have a cook who does all, her job is to just cook for us and does nothing else on the ship at all. Um, it's actually really nice to be able to come in here and eat because it's our, actually our time off. So the food time is very important to us and I believe that keeping a full stomach stops me getting seasick. Okay, should we go and have a look at the bridge? What is the bridge? It's where the captain steers the ship and we're going to go right up there now. Right guys, this is Lee, he's the captain of the ship. How you he's doing? going to show you around the bridge. Hello. Right. Well, welcome to the wheelhouse on the Weatherbird 2. This is where we actually operate the ship. One on one of you get into the uh, wheelhouse chair. Jonathan, you're the closest. And uh, why don't you come stand over and I'll show you some of the instruments we use to safely navigate the ship. These are the engine controls. We've got two engines on the Weatherbird 2, and they're about 500 horses each. This is how we steer the ship with the uh, tiller. Uh, we also have backup systems on most of the things I'll be showing you. This is the automatic pilot and it, it operates the ship a lot better than a human can when you're going on long runs. It, keeps, it helps the rudder move back and forth to keep a steady course. Uh, one of the biggest improvements we've done to the Weatherbird 2 was adding a bow thruster. This, this bow thruster is like a jet ski. Have y'all ever seen jet skis? Yes. It operates just like that. It's a jet pump but it's 350 horsepower, so it'd be a pretty big jet ski. And we can, we can train the thrust in any direction. Uh, we can actually bring the ship home. I mentioned to you redundancy, backup systems. This is a backup for our main engines. We can lose our whole main engine room and still get home on our bow thruster because we can steer the ship with it. And we can also use the automatic pilot, so it actually bring, can get us home. How did this boat get its name? Yeah, that's a good question. The uh, Weatherbird 2 name was, came up from a contest they had here at the biological station, and they asked uh, the employees at the time to name the original Weatherbird 2, which was a smaller version of this one. And they uh, named it after a local uh, old timer, and he was kind of a folk philosopher. His name was Weatherbird, and uh, therefore we kept the Weatherbird 2 as a name for the new ship. And uh, We've actually had his, uh, his brother has retired here and has uh, done a poem about Weatherbird, and so it's quite an interesting story. Professor Irvin Mervin Nutty, and I have got one exciting experiment for you today. Okay, 
let's take a look here. We have, um, get yourself together all these ingredients I'm going to list to you right now. Okay, we're going to take um, a couple of eggs. We're going to take some water, you know, about this much water. And you need two cups, about this big. A um, little tiny bit of milk, about this much milk. And some table salt. Now, here's the experiment. Goggles on at all times, okay? Don't want to hurt yourself. Okay, so, here we go. Now, you're going to add the water to the two uh, cups here, all right? Like this. Whoops. Watch out for that. Um, okay, now, here we go. So, the first cup, we're going to put a little drop of milk in there, just like this. Make it pretty. Give a little bit of color, all right? And then, the second cup, you're going to add some table salt, about three uh, tablespoons of salt. Um, here's a cup that I've already added salt to beforehand. So, one cup has the salt in it, and one cup has your milk. Now, which one, can you guess, kids, which one is denser and dense enough to make the egg float? Which one is the magic solution? All right, let's take a look. We have table salt, and we have milk. Which one will the egg float in? Oh, my! Wasn't that great? Now, let me explain to you why this happens. You see, milky water, egg is denser than the water. Egg sinks, you see? But then when you have the magic solution, or the salty water, the egg is actually less dense than the water. The, the salt makes the water denser, so the water is denser than the egg. You catch my drift? Isn't that great? Okay, kids. Wasn't that wonderful? Another exciting experiment for me. Professor Irvin, Mervin, Knight. And I'll see you kids next time on Learn Lots. Um, what we've got is a collection of sand here that's been collected from a variety of places around the island. And what I'd like you to come and see over here is the differences in the sand from the different places. And really what sand can tell us quite a lot about is the geologic evidence from around the island. Sand is made up of rocks and shells that have been broken up from the outer reef. So we can see quite a lot of evidence, for example in this one of shells and pieces of coral. An important thing we can see here quite clearly is all these pink bits of sand. Now, do you know what these are? It's stuff that makes the pink beaches. That's right, it's what makes the beaches pink here. It's one of the main things that makes the beaches pink. And what these are, are collections of microscopic animals known as forams. Now, they build a hard skeleton in much the same way as the corals do. And they grow on the backs of rocks and on the backs of corals much the same as they grow on the back of this piece of coral here. You can see all the little pink patches here. So that's uh, lots and lots of forearms there. And when they die, they get pounded off when we have hurricanes and winter storms, and they make our beaches have that pinky, pinky look to them. Why is this sand more finer than this sand? Okay, what we've got in these three different dishes is sand from three different places. And in this one we've got sand, a small amount of sand that we collected from Nonsuch Island, from Turtle Beach. This one came from Church Bay, and this one came from an offshore wreck site just off St David's Head. And as you can probably see, and the question that you asked me was about the different coarseness of the sands. You can see this one's very fine. It means that it's really come from a reasonably sheltered bay, in which there's very little, not too much water movement. So the only things that the water can move are very fine particles. By contrast, this one has come from a, very, a place where there's a lot of wave activity and a lot, lot, lots and lots of energy in those waves that can pick up large particles and pound them against the reef. So you tend to get this sort of component of sand offshore, but by the time it comes into the reef, the waves haven't got so much energy, so they just tend to pick up smaller particles. And you can probably tell that Church Bay, where this sample came from, is rougher than Turtle Beach because it's much coarser. Okay, well what we've got here are two different plankton nets. 
I don't know what you know about plankton, but there's two different types of plankton. There's the animals, which is called zooplankton, and there's the plants that are called phytoplankton. And the zooplankton tend to be much larger than the phytoplankton. So this is a zooplankton net. And if you take a feel of the net here, it feels quite coarse, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's because the mesh size is quite big. This is what we'll take out in the boat in just a minute, and um, hopefully collect lots of marine zooplankton. This net here is a phytoplankton net. If you take a feel of this one by comparison, you can feel it's, yeah, it's soft, yeah. isn't it? It's quite silky. So this is a much, much finer mesh size because the phytoplankton tends to be a lot smaller than the zooplankton. The best time to collect zooplankton is, is at night, but we're going to go out and see what we're going to collect during the day. And no doubt we'll collect quite a lot of zooplankton, but we'd collect more if we did it at night. Okay, so what we're going to do now is pour what we collected from the plankton net into this glass dish so we can see better. And we just let it settle out, stop moving from the current. For me pouring it in, we should be able to see quite a few things darting around. We've already spotted a crab larvae in here and a couple of arrow worms. Why do you go out and do the plankton tours? Plankton's a really, really important part of the ocean ecosystem. It forms a really important productivity layer on top of the ocean surface. And the reason that the, the big ship goes out and collects plankton is really looking at biomass, looking at the productivity of the oceans, and also looking at what makes up the oceans in terms of plankton. Plankton's incredibly important in terms of the um, nutrient fluxes through the ocean. They take up a lot of things like carbon and nitrogen from the ocean surface, and then when they migrate, like I said, they migrate down during the day to avoid being eaten by predators. That takes a large amount of that carbon and nitrogen and the other nutrients they take up when they feed down to the, the lower areas of the ocean. Okay, this is the wave tank here at the biological station. And what we've got in here are quite a few of the living things that you'd find out on the reefs around Bermuda. So what I'm going to do is just point out a few of these things. Well, coral is very fussy, a very fussy animal. And it likes particular conditions in which to live. So it's actually quite difficult to get corals to live out, out of their natural environment. I told you that this was called the wave tank, and the reason for that is that every few minutes there's a wave of water that passes over all the things that live in this tank. Corals require nice clear water, and they require a certain temperature and a certain light intensity. And some of the pieces of coral that live in here are quite happy, but there's quite a few species that, that won't live in here because they just won't tolerate the, 
being away from the natural environment very well. Traveling around the island with the Learn A Lots program, we sometimes come across areas that are in need of attention. Here we are at Great Head Park in St. David's, and it's quite trashy. This is not the kind of thing we want on Bermuda's roads. Let's do something about it. For the Learn A Lots program, this is Tony Trash. Uh, good morning, my name is Declan O'Connell. I'm a field technician here for the air quality program. And this morning, we would like to uh, demonstrate some of the instruments we have. On my right hand side here is an instrument called a high volume sampler. And this morning, I'd like to give you a quick demonstration of how it works. With me, if you could take this filter, we'll come over and show you how it goes. Okay. This is almost like a vacuum cleaner. A clean, dry filter goes on top here. Uh, if you'd like to remove it from the Ziploc bag. We use a Ziploc bag to keep everything clean and to keep it undamaged. The filter paper goes on top here. This filter holder over it. Kenton, if you could tighten up those three. And Whitney, if you want to do one or two of these. The high volume sampler collects all the suspended particulates that are in the air, it sucks the air through the filter and afterwards there will be a layer of deposit on the filter which we take back inside, dry it, re-weigh it and use the, the weights of the clean filter, the weight of the dirty filter to get an idea of how much dirt and particulates is in the air. Okay. First of all, we would take an idea of what time it is. So it's 11.36. And then we connect up the power. And on the Ziploc bag, we would write down the location, the bio station. We would write down the date and the time. On Wednesday, 23rd of July. We let these run for 24 hours and 24 hours later you come back and you turn it off and bring the filter back to, the, to your laboratory and reweigh it and work out calculations. Okay, let's see what the filter looks like today after 24 hours of operation. As you can see, there is quite a lot of suspended particulates collected on the filter. If you remember from yesterday, this is what a clean, dry filter looks like. And today, as you can see, the filter has gone quite a grey colour when compared with the, the initial colour of the clean, dry filter. If you could help me remove the filter now, we will put it back in the Ziploc bag so it can be ready for analysis in the lab later. I have some filters we've taken from other sites around the island inside the van if you'd like to take a look. So the five sites around Bermuda, one is at Prospect, one is at St. David's, one is at the incinerator plant, one is near Belco, and one is at East Broadway. As you can see, the East Broadway one is the darkest and that reflects its position as this high volume sampler is quite close to the roadway and it catches all the rush hour traffic in and out of town. What does that machine in here do? This instrument is called a toxic gas monitor. It can be used to measure NO2 or SO2, that's nitrogen dioxide or sulfur dioxide. As you can see from the paper printout, it is taking a five minute average of the NO2 concentration in the air and it's reading from four to six parts per billion, which is very low. So overall, the air quality in Bermuda is quite high. Hello. 
my main job here at the BioStation is to do research to extend the historical record of hurricanes because the problem is, is that the historical record, instrumental record, is only about 100 years long. And so if you're trying to determine, for instance, the um, probability or likelihood that a very intense storm is going to make landfall at some location, it's very difficult to do because there may have only been two storms in that 100-year period to, do, to make landfall. So what I'm trying to do is to extend the historical record further back in time, maybe several centuries or even thousands of years. There's two main ways I do that. One is by looking at tree rings from the Bermuda Cedar. And these rings, which are, we believe, annual rings laid down by the tree as it grows, might be able to record some signal of being hit by a hurricane, a hurricane perhaps by the tree being uprooted and laying down a very narrow ring, or else by having all the trees around it blown down and thus laying down a wide ring. And if we don't, we, we can get both these kinds of cross sections from uh, dead trees or from a living tree if someone happens to be cutting one down. But our preferred method is to do a less invasive technique. Instead of taking a cross section, we actually go out to a tree and use a little increment tree borer to take a core from the tree. It's just like this, and that's less uh, damaging to the tree, obviously, than cutting it down. So this is our preferred method. Now once we've taken a core like this, you can see it's pretty hard to see anything because we haven't prepared the samples. So what we do is take that piece, put it into one of these little wooden blocks, and then sand it flat. And that really brings out the grain and allows you to see the individual rings, which would allow you hopefully to see a hurricane record within those rings. The people in our wood, wood shop do that. You might wonder why we are in a cave looking for signals of a hurricane, and the basic idea behind that is that the rain from a hurricane differs chemically from the rain from normal summer rainfall. It's, it's isotopically lighter, so that the elements within it tend to be a little lighter than normal summer rain. Thus, if you come down into a cave and look at something like this, this is a stalactite, you can see just like a tree, it also lays down annual rings or rings of some time period. So at one time this stalactite was only this big and then over time it's grown outwards. And if you take one of these and make a cross section like this and then sample inwards towards the core of the stalactite and measure the isotopic composition of the calcium carbonate that makes up this stalactite, you can actually hopefully be able to see a record of hurricanes through time because the water that made this actually came from rainwater from a hurricane and from other sources through time. And that's how we see the record, or hope to see the record at least. Are there any questions? How come you only take samples from stalactites and not stalactites? It's a very good question. What I'm showing you right here is a stalactite. And I remember that because stalactite has a C, which means it's on the ceiling. But what I usually take samples from are stalagmites, which are on the ground at the floor of the cave. The reason we don't take samples from stalactites is because most stalactites are hollow and have water dripping down through the middle of them all the time. And that tends to dilute the signal that we're looking for. When we look at the ones on the floor of the cave, the stalagmites, those grow upwards by little drops, and so they tend to have a more clear signal, and it's not as diluted by the water pouring through them.